My name is Keith Tebow. I'm the director of FRC Media at Bristol Community College, and I will serve as the moderator for tonight's debate. Voters in Fall River will go to the polls on March 12th to decide whether to recall Mayor Jaziel Correa II. If successful, voters will also choose the city's next mayor. We'll hear from those candidates here tonight. Joining us are City Councilor Joe Camara. School committee man, Paul Coogan. <laughs> Mayor Jaziel Carrera II. Thank you. Kyle Riley. And Erica Scott Pacheco. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Asking questions tonight is a panel of local journalists representing media outlets here in Fall River. They are to my immediate right, Lynn Sullivan, Editor-in-Chief at the Herald News. <laughs> Susan Netter from WSAR. <laughs> Pamela Martin from Fall River Government Television. <laughs> and Donna Mata from FRC-TV. Also, I'd like to recognize our timekeeper in the front row here, Greg Sullivan, also from the Herald News. We'd like to thank the staff of Morton Middle School for hosting us tonight, and the staff of Fall River Government Television and FRC Media for providing television coverage of tonight's debate. Yeah, thank you. The format for tonight's debate is as follows. Each candidate will provide a three-minute opening statement. The order of the statements was determined by a draw. Then our panelists will ask questions of the candidates. Every candidate will have two minutes to answer each question. We will then allow the candidates, in the same order they answered the question initially, a one-minute rebuttal if they so choose. It is not mandatory to, to take the rebuttal. At the end of the debate, we'll also have another three-minute closing statement, again, the order determined by a draw. Now here's the disclaimer we tend to say at this point of the debate with the audience here today. We want to ensure that all candidates, of course, are heard tonight. We ask that you refrain from any verbal outburst during the course of the debate. As moderator, I do have the discretion to allow a candidate more time to answer a question if interrupted. Thank you for your consideration. For some reason, too, I was given a gavel I hope I don't have to use it. All right, so let's get started with our opening statement. Our first three-minute opening statement will be given by City Councilor Joe Camara. Joe. Good. Good evening. My name is Joe Camara. I'd like to thank the various media outlets, including the Herald News, WSAR, FRC Media, and FRG TV, for being part of this important debate. A special thanks to everyone for taking the time of their day to be here. I'd like to thank the citizens of Fall River for trusting me with the honor of serving on the City Council for the past 23 years. During my tenure on the City Council, I have had the honor of working with six mayors, six school superintendents, four police chiefs, and eight fire chiefs. As a lifelong resident of Fall River, a homeowner, and active contributor within our beloved community, I cannot sit idly by as Fall River's reputation is tarnished on a national stage and while relationships at the State House and in Congress are deteriorating. Despite what our mayor would like you to believe, the federal charges against him are serious and he has a long road ahead of him that will require a considerable amount of time and attention. Regardless of the outcome, the constant negative PR resulting from his indictments is hurting our city and has cast a dark shadow over the progress that we have made here. Two of the state's most influential elected officials, Governor Baker and Congressman Kennedy, have called for the mayor's resignation, as have many business owners and voters of Fall River. For these reasons, I believe our mayor has lost his ability to lead, and it's time we bring honesty and integrity back to government center. I want to make it very clear that I previously supported our mayor because I believe that he had the ability and skill necessary to move our city forward. 
However, given the charges and the circumstances that have been levied against him, these criminal indictments have seriously impacted his ability to serve the people of Fall River. Trust matters. Since I was elected to the city council, I have always been impressed with the spirit of the people of our city, the pride that exists, and the need to give back through public service. There has always been an overwhelming pride that exists with our citizens, a pride that has been tarnished with the recent issues surrounding our mayor, but a pride that I feel can be restored with my experience and full-time commitment to serving as Fall River's next mayor. I will bring stability, experience, and accountability back to the mayor's office, and I will restore public's confidence by prioritizing public safety, education, and creating more jobs for our residents. Experience matters. I've always appreciated the faith and trust you have bestowed upon me as an elected official. From this point forward, we must unite as a community, and I firmly believe that together, there are no boundaries we cannot overcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next opening statement will be provided by Kyle Riley. Thank you. First, let me thank the sponsors of this debate. I would be remiss if I didn't thank the small group of individuals who, when they saw the need, they stood up and made sure the democratic process was at work. Also, the individuals who are on stage with me tonight, I have to believe they love this city, and that's what drives them. I want to briefly tell you about my experiences that drive me and make me believe I'm qualified to be the next mayor of Fall River. It's the lens that I look out of each day that was developed through the good people of this city. It's the parents that I have coached with, the ones I watched from the sidelines with and shared those life experiences with. It's the educators that helped me, the ones I worked with and the ones that guide my children. It's the citizens who believed in me to elect me to the school committee and city council. It's my mother who raised two boys by herself in Section 8 housing while continuing to work at least two jobs all the while. It's my wife and kids who keep me honest and sometimes humble, who have the opportunities that all kids should have to be successful and who deserve a chance to remain in this city like Anna and I did if they choose and they can prosper. We have some work to do. We need to make sure that the education found funding equals results for our kids. The money's not enough. Educational attainment and employment skills need to rise. We need to make sure that planned economic development is taking place and that we as a city are aggressively seeking out new businesses and that they complement the direction we want our city to go in. We need to make sure local government is working together and efficiently. When we retain our stability is when we re-engage with state and federal officials. So I understand this is a mouthful. I understand it also won't be without its challenges, but that's why I'm here. I've always welcomed the opportunity to roll up my sleeves and work hard for the city I love. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next opening statement will be presented by Paul Coogan. Thanks, everybody. Hi, I'm Paul Coogan, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers of tonight's debate for the opportunity to address you this evening. I believe that public service is a noble calling. For close to three decades, I worked to improve education in Fall River as an educator, an administrator, and a member of our school committee. But I feel the time has come to take on a new challenge as mayor of Fall River. I intend to bring a hands-on, highly visible approach to the mayor's office. Leading by example, I will work full time to restore morale and a sense of civic pride in our community. I will ensure that our residents and our public employees alike have a strong voice in crafting the future of their city government. I believe that local government has the most direct impact on the quality of our citizens' lives. And I'm sure tonight the mayor will recite his campaign laundry list of achievements, but they will not be able to wash away the dark clouds swirling over him and our city. Remember, he told us he knew of no FBI investigation. Grand juries, subpoenas, tax fraud, 13 felony criminal charges, followed with 18,000 pages of testimony 
it is over the top, especially for someone leading Fall River. And I say to the mayor, go clear your name, resolve these legal issues, and come back. Fall River is a strong believer in redemption. But Fall River also faces many other challenges. And I have laid out a platform addressing the issues of public safety, the opioid crisis, economic development, housing, and most of these solutions take a team approach. By working closely with elected officials in Fall River, Boston, and Washington, we will allow our city to reestablish necessary relationships that will focus solely on improving the quality of life for everyone in Fall River. To be successful, all these relationships must be built on a foundation of honesty, transparency, accountability, and integrity, the very trademark of this campaign. I have met so many people who share both their concerns and ideas about ways to improve our city, and listening will be the hallmark of leadership. Together, we have a great opportunity to rebuild our city. The future can be bright. If elected, I pledge to bring integrity beyond reproach to the office of mayor. I pledge to work full time with all elected officials, and I pledge to include your voice in this process. And finally, I pledge to provide the type of honest leadership you all deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, next up for our three minute opening statement, Erica Scott Pacheco. Good evening, my name is Erica Scott Pacheco and I would like to thank FRC Media, WSAR, uh, FR Government TV, and the Herald News, last but not least, for hosting this event tonight. Today, it is truly my honor to be here and to address you, the voters and residents of Fall River, in this forum and present some of my concrete plans and solutions for our city. I also want to thank my team. I am the only candidate who is still holding a, a full-time job, private employment in the private sector, and I really am only able to be here tonight thanks to my team and my family who's also here in the audience and have been supporting me. I'm not politically connected. I've never held office. No one in my family works for the city, and no one in my family has held office before. I'm like you in many ways. I work full time, I pay my rent, I pay my car loan, and I pay my student loans. That's one of the reasons that I'm running for mayor. Now, two of my opponents tonight have said to you that there is a dark cloud or a dark shadow over our city. Well, I'm here tonight to tell you that is not the case. Our city, our Fall River is not broken. What is broken is the system. For far too long, we keep having a revolving cast of the same characters expecting different results. I ask you, are you broken? The people of Fall River are the city. The people of Fall River are not broken. We are resilient, strong, hardworking, and proud people. And that's why I'm running to elect you, or I'm running to serve you, and I'm asking for your vote. In my campaign, I've talked to hundreds of Fall River voters, door knocking, going to community events, and that's what I always do. I work for a nonprofit downtown, serving Fall River families, elders, and people with disabilities, and I live in the Flint. I continue to be a community activist because it's what I've done my entire life. I have 15 years experience in nonprofit financial management and grant writing. And that background in the private sector empowers me to serve you as the mayor and the leader that you deserve. In my campaign, I'm elevating issues like affordable housing, safe sanitary housing. I've heard from so many voters who are worried they're going to be priced out of our city. I'm elevating public safety and infrastructure because we all deserve to live in a safe and clean neighborhood. And I'm also concerned with good paying jobs and education. In closing, I'm going to do something a little different because this campaign is not just about me, it's about you. I ask you to turn to your neighbor and say thank you for being here because tonight we are all part of the civic process. So I thank all of you and I ask that you thank one another. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Please, thank you. Our final opening statement tonight, Mayor Jay Zuccaria. Thank you. Please, 
Clock starting now. <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, to everyone that put this wonderful exercise together tonight. I want to thank, uh, first and foremost, uh, all the voters out there who have elected me to the office of mayor twice, and I'm asking them to elect me a third time on March 12th and continue to solidify the progress that we've made here in the city of Fall River over the last three years. Uh, very important to me, I want to thank my family and my friends, my team at City Hall, uh, just an awesome a group of people from the sixth floor to the first floor through all the different departments, the school department, the police department, the fire department, DCM, and so many of you that make our city work every single day. And this, as you all know, is a team effort. I cannot do this job without the hundreds and thousands of people that make the city operate on a daily basis. So I thank them, and you can give them a round of applause if you'd like. Uh, they're just an awesome group of people. Thank you. So uh, tonight, I, I want to have a conversation with the public. Uh, I do have my opponents here, and I, I recognize all of them, of course, and I think they're all wonderful people individually. I have nothing bad to say about any of them. But tonight, I want to have a conversation with the public, and that's because this ballot is a two-part ballot. The first ballot on March 12th is a vote to recall myself, Jaisal Cray II, or a vote against the recall. And I'm asking those that are watching and those that are voting to vote against. So because of that fact, tonight is really going to be, for me, a conversation with each of you to convince you of the facts, to give you the facts, to explain the things that we've done as mayor over the last three and a half years. Uh, that's really what this election is about. That's what every single day when you wake up and go to work, that's what this is about. It's your life. And life has continued over the last five months, and we are going to continue some of the great progress that we've made. You've already heard from some of my opponents tonight uh, talk about uh, the indictment issue. That's an issue that we can touch upon, but it's also an issue that uh, we're going to address in the long call as well. Tonight's about the things that we've accomplished for you, for your life, for the renter, the homeowner, the senior, the veteran, the family, the child in this community. That's what you hired me to do three and a half years ago, and that's what I'm going to continue to talk about each and every day that I'm on the job. And that's what we're here to, uh, to discuss. So what have we done? Well, let's, let's turn the clocks back three years ago. Uh, we had a mayor that said the city was on the brink of receivership. We had layoffs over the last decade to our police and fire department. We had layoffs and pink slips to our teachers. That was a dark cloud over this community. Mayors saying that the city was in the brink of receivership and leaving us with half a million dollars in stabilization was the dark cloud. We have come forward, we have come out of that, and you're going to hear many of the accomplishments tonight that will hopefully uh, continue to show you the progress that we've made. And I ask that you vote for me, Jaisal Craig II, on March 12th, and vote against the recall. Thank you, and I look forward to the debate. Thank, thank you very much. Again, I want to caution the audience going forward, please. No applause. Let the candidates, we want to, do want to hear from the candidates tonight. I've got the gavel. Let's start with our first set of questions. The first question will be asked by Lynn Sullivan of the Herald News, and first to answer will be Councillor Joe Camara. Lynn? We all know why we're here and the reasons for this recall election. So I'm going to be direct. Why should Fall River trust you? Why should Fall River trust me? Mm -hmm. That's the question. Thank you. That's an excellent question. Well, it's not so much why they should trust me, but the question should be, how many years have they trust me for? I've been on the council for 23 years. And from the first day that I ran for office, I said that I'm going to hold true to my beliefs and do everything I can to make this city a better place for all of us. And I've held true to that belief. I've worked very hard to make things good for this community. And every two years, I have to go back to the voters and reaffirm the trust that they have in me by showing them what I've done as a city councilor, all the accomplishments that I've made, from my first resolution that I ever filed, would had to do with relining the water mains. I can remember prior to being elected, people would come to the city council chambers with jars of dirty water. Many of you out there will remember the jars of dirty water where they couldn't take a bath, they couldn't wash their clothes because the pipes, the water mains were rusty and old. And I filed a resolution to replace those water mains. That was the first resolution I filed. As of today, we've relined 60 miles of water mains and I've made sure that every year Money is put into that fund to continue to reline the water mains. There's 40 miles left, and then we'll have the entire city completely remodeled, redone with new water mains. Apart from that, the schools that I've built in this community and everything else that I've done year after year, every two years, like I said, the issues that come up, whether it's working 
to provide jobs for our residents, funding public safety, making sure that the police officers and the fire departments have the tools necessary and the manpower necessary to protect our citizens. Every two years, I have to go back, and it's been 12 elections that they've trusted me for during my entire tenure on the city council. And I'm going to continue to be truthful to the residents and make sure that every day I go to work, I research the issues, and make sure that every vote I take is in the best interest of this community. And I'm going to continue to fight for them to keep LNG out of this facility as I have done and everything Thank else. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Coogan. The people of Fall River should trust me because of my 27-year record of serving your children and the city of Fall River. Never had a bad write-up always had excellent evaluations, and worked extremely hard to make sure I could keep parents, staff, and children going in the right direction. Wasn't always successful, but I never did anything wrong, and I have focused my entire campaign on honesty, integrity, the hallmarks of things you need to be successful. I do not for one minute believe that the people on this stage have the education, the experience, the work history or the personal skills that I do that I plan to bring to this position. I think that by working with people, listening to people, and getting things done, you exhibit a type of integrity and honesty that the citizens of this city respect. Again, I never had any kind of legal problems or anything like that, and I work extremely hard, and if you give me the opportunity, you'll see what we're able to accomplish to bring Fall River back to a moral plane where people respect government and don't snicker and talk about us when we go around the corner. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please, thank you, thank you. Mayor Correa. Okay, well thank you for the question. So uh, I wanna break this down in a couple ways. Number one, the community should continue to trust me, our residents should trust me, uh, Jaisal Correa II, because I have fulfilled my promises. I am the one that's put myself out there that said I was gonna eliminate $120 trash fee in my first term, and I did it. I said I was gonna eliminate pay as you throw, the purple bag program, and I did it. I said that we could do those two things, eliminate money that we're, we were taking from the public and still increase the police and fire department, and we did that and increased our police and fire department by 20%. I said we could do those things, eliminate fees, and also still fund our schools, and we've done that. We together at this team has, have done some, what some people would call the impossible. Uh, there is no other community in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that has eliminated fees and still increased services the way that this community has over just a three year period. So I'm asking for more time to continue to show you what other fees we want to eliminate, what other things we want to do in our community. Things like building a transfer station so we can control the destiny of our trash, which was overwhelmingly supported by a non-binding ballot question by our taxpayers uh, several years ago. Things like creating a, a wind energy corridor along our waterfront to seize the next opportunity of economic development for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and our region. There are a lot of students in this community that are gonna work with their hands, that are gonna become welders, that are gonna become plumbers, that are gonna become electricians. And those are really high, great paying jobs that they can get right here in Fall River if we seize that opportunity. There is not a day that goes by that I have not worked and earned the trust of this community. I can't control that I was accused of something in my youth that I will be vindicated of. I can't control that, that's not my fault. None of these candidates here can tell you of one thing that I've been accused of and charged with that I did as the mayor of the city of Fall River. I ruffled some feathers, it came back to bite me, and I'm gonna beat that, and I hope that you'll be there with me and we'll continue to lead this city into the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Riley. Thank you. One of the most important things is trust. I'd like to start off by saying it's a personal matter for me. I need the trust to be developed between me and my family from the start. When I say family, I mean my children, my six children, that every day when I go out of the house, I look at them in the eye and say, you have a good day. Dad's going out to support you. Dad's going to be there for you when you get back. I live my day like that with them. I think of them throughout this process here, when I'm going door to door, when I'm knocking on doors and making sure I'm talking to the community. But I'm also someone who's been an educator for a long period of time, someone who's been promoted throughout my career and someone who's helped kids along the way, from a teacher to a vice principal to a principal who worked in an alternative education program, turned it around, made sure that kids were coming to school, that they had the uh, education they needed, the support they needed, socioeconomic support, 
but also that they showed up every day with someone there to care for them. Trust is something you build through being involved in the community, from being president of youth soccer for 20 years of involvement, coaching, coaching in basketball, being an elk here in the city for 22 years. I've been involved regardless of its, um, elections or if it's just being involved in my community or just being my family involved in the community. This community has been everything to me. It has allowed me from the start to go through the um, pieces of my life that sometimes were difficult. And sometimes I could look back and say, the things that I did, the things that I accomplished were because of the people that were around me on a daily basis. I had their trust and they had trust back in me. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Scott Pacheco. I'm asking you, the voters of Fall River, to place your trust in me and vote yes on recall and for me, Erica Scott Pacheco, on March 12th because I have built my career establishing and proving that I keep my promises. Specifically, my current position is Director of Development in charge of fundraising a multi-million dollar budget, building the budget, fundraising for the budget, and reporting on the budget. And what that means is that the process of a grant, in many ways, is like keeping a political promise. So there's three steps I'll go through with you. The first step is you make the promise. That's the goal of the grant. The second step is you do the work. And the third step is you prove it. That's the reporting. For someone to not keep their promises, to not be trustworthy in development, it's a really good way to lose your job pretty quickly. Lose the grant, lose your job. I've been very successful. I have 15 years working in this field. I've been promoted to being in the top of my field. And that's why I'm asking you, the voters, to place your trust in me. Also, because I believe that hard work is not just a noun. It's a verb. I am running for mayor because I have chosen to live here, to work here, and to invest here, to build my future here, like so many of you. I believe that there is dignity and hard work that people who built the city on their backs and worked in the mill should not be priced out of our city just because like some of my opponents want to bring in high-end housing into those very mills. My concrete plans and solutions are for you, and they are not trump cards. I will not pull out and keep a campaign promise at the 11th hour. I will do it from the get-go because it is the right thing to do. Thank you. One minute rebuttal. Council Camara, first. Well, it's not so much a rebuttal, but <clears throat> I just want to um, go back to Mrs. Scott's opening statement. She said she's the only person on here with a full-time job. I also have a full-time job. And, you know, when I talk about why people should trust me, I work with a lot of contractors, a lot of businesses. And I'm a sales, I'm on commission. And these people trust me with their business, trust me with their employees. I've coached a lot of youth organizations, and these parents trust me with their children. And in the community, people out there who know me, they trust me. City hall, department heads, employees, they trust me. People in the general public, they trust me because I'm trustworthy. I've never broken a promise to people. I've made a lot of promises. A lot of the things that I've accomplished in this community is because people know they can come to me and tell me what they want to tell me and I've never broken their trust. I get through to them and tell them and I'll help them any way possible, but trust is a very important thing to me and it's something that I, I know people believe in me and that's why I'm trustworthy, thank you. Mr. Coogan, one minute. Sure. Um, trust, integrity, honesty, they all go together. It's my position that every day when I walk through the halls of Durfee or one of the middle schools when I was a vice principal there, those parents were trusting us to do best for them and their kids. And as I said before, I showed up every day and I worked hard. But I do want to rebut one thing the mayor said. When he said he didn't do anything untrustworthy while he was mayor, I believe creating a fake website to go after a reporter that he admitted to doing, which I have never done anything like that, um, puts me in a different class than him. I would never create a fake website or use any type of political getbacks to get anybody. Whether you're with me or against me, I respect you and I will treat you that way. And we're gonna run the city government that way. There will be no get back websites or trying to make someone look bad. If we disagree, we'll shake hands and go our separate ways. Thank you. Mayor Correa, one minute. Yeah, just to reiterate, you know, each and every day, uh, I have to work with all the department heads in our community. Uh, all of our city employees in our community, and they have trusted me to be their leader. 
uh, and I think we've done a great job uh, from the fire department uh, to community development agency to the police department uh, all the way down to uh, the school department to DCM that takes a lot of trust they got to trust me that if I say hey you know what we're gonna eliminate this fee that we're gonna have the money to keep their jobs so it was an extre extremely important balance for me as the mayor especially a young mayor coming in at 23 years old I know I had to prove myself to the public but I had to prove myself to our city employees and they had to trust me to say yes we can responsibly give rid of this fee but you're not going to lose anything you're not going to lose your job you're not going to see brownouts in the fire department you're not going to see overtime cut we're not cutting services we're going to eliminate these fees which the public wants but we're also going to continue the trust that we are going to fund these departments at a higher degree than we never than we've ever done it before which is what we achieved and that took a lot of trust and i'm just so thankful that those people gave me the opportunity thank you. to do that thank you Mr. Riley, one minute. Yes, thank you. So I generally have a hard time when someone says, I'm the only one that can do this. Uh, in Mr. Coogan's statement, he said, I'm the only one with the educational experience and the um, job experience. Uh, I'm afraid we'll hear that more tonight from different people. Uh, you know, I think we bring something, we all bring something different to the table. I certainly bring the same job experience as a principal. Uh, as a vice principal and a teacher, but also as a principal and a director of special education, both in suburban and urban school districts. I bring that experience as an assistant superintendent. I bring it as a dad every day, as I shared with you before. I got my education here in Massachusetts, two different um, schools, UMass Dartmouth, Suffolk University, and then for my masses, Cambridge College. And each and every day, I drove to those facilities knowing the kids I had home, knowing the work I had in front of me, and knowing the things I had to do for my community. That's the person you trust. Someone's working hard every day for you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Scott Pacheco, one minute. I think that everyone on this stage cares about Fall River. So I'm not here to argue about who has more experience or integrity, because those are not tangible, measurable, things. I believe in facts. Let's look at the facts. Jaisal Correa stated that he has been successful at lowering fees and taxes. Well, if you look at just the first three months when he uh, was mayor, 331.16, he increased the sewer user fee and the water user fee. In October 16, he had to transfer $1.5 million from free cash to meet fiscal year 15 net school spending shortfall. And then the state asked for almost $3,000 back from a grant after his uh, health department was reorganized and Mike Aguiar, a close friend and mentor of his, was appointed to be the substance use coordinator and went to New York to a five-star hotel on Thank your you. tax dollars. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will be asked by Sue Netter from WSAR, and first to answer will be Paul Coogan. We can all agree that Fall River is experience, experiencing an alarming increase in crime, shootings in broad daylight, stabbings, etc. The citizens of Fall River have had enough. Some of you have said in various interviews that adding police is the answer, but adding police takes time and money. So how will you immediately address this increase in street crime? Mr. Coogan, two minutes. Obviously, some of these uh, recent events are deplorable and everybody feels the same way. We don't want them to continue. Um, I have already been meeting with some of the um, neighborhood presidents that feel disconnected. They refer back to a time when they would work with the police chief, work with the mayor's office. If they had an issue, they'd call. There was another few hundred sets of eyes on the road, watching, reporting, letting people know what's going on just as our presidents of our senior housing association feel the same way. These people have all been slid to the side and they're no longer as vibrant and as active in the community as they could be. It's my position that if we can get these people back and have them reporting to us what they see in their specific neighborhoods, it will help the four of the police. But with that being said, our police need to know that they're respected, they work hard, and they're out there protecting the citizens in Fall River every day. In my job at Durfee and at uh, RPA, even when I worked for People Incorporated, I worked with the police every day. And I know the respect they deserve and how hard they work. This is a job of keeping everyone in the city safe. And I believe that a few of the simple ideas I have with increasing cameras, 
getting some of these blue light boxes in some of our bigger parks like Kennedy and Heritage so that people can walk and feel safe and know that if they pull a, uh, a buzzer, someone's going to be there to respond. I think simple things like this, increasing our public awareness, reaching out to the neighborhood associations. Uh, as mayor, I'll be more than willing to meet with them on a regular basis to find out what's going on in the various neighborhoods around this city and make them feel comfortable and make them feel they have a seat at the table. Thank you. Mayor Correa, two minutes. So public safety is the top issue uh, in our community. But all these issues are, of course, inter interconnected. Education, economic development, public safety, they cannot operate in silos. And in the past, they have operated in silos. And I'm sure when we get to an economic development question, I'll address that. But in terms of public safety, what we've done, we've done a lot for our, our, uh, our police and fire department, uh, but specifically around this issue. You have to, you have to take, a, take a step back. The prior conversation in previous debates on the last three mayors prior to me was not how many more cops are we going to put on the street. It was how many are we going to keep because we're going to have to issue pink slips and layoffs to our firefighters and police officers. That's deplorable. That's a black cloud over this city. When you can't even keep enough cops on the streets, that's a problem. And that's because of fiscal irresponsibility. This administration has taken the city to a new height in fiscal responsibility. $7 million in stabilization funds. Continued increases to our public safety departments. Just a few of the highlights. 75 new radios. 33 more coming. 10 new police cruisers updated tasers, camera systems. These are the things that my administration has been working on. Now, the police department is an awesome group of individuals. They can't be everywhere all the time, and they can't predict crime. But questions that say, you know, we can all agree, this question tonight posed, we can all agree that there's been an increase in street crime, that does not, that's not true. The facts are not that. That's, again, painting the city by the media, painting the city in a negative light. And that's wrong. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do? We're going to increase our police overtime. That's what we're going to do in our next budget. Because I've sat down with the police department. I've sat down with people in this community that know what they're talking about because I'm not always the smartest guy in the room. I'm certainly not always the smartest guy in the room. We're going to increase overtime. And we're going to get 12 cars on the street. We're going to make sure that our police officers feel protected and they have other people behind them. Thank you. That's what we're going to do. Thank you. Mr. Riley. Thank you. And thanks for the question. One of the first things that I released in this campaign was my press release about adding 50 new officers. And I know that's not what your question is directly. It's how to do it right away. I took the opportunity just last night to do a ride along with uh, a police officer in our city during a snowstorm. And it really was a couple fold for me. I got a chance to sit down and see what it looked like downtown, see what it looked like at night, see what some of those conversations were like, hear about some of the things that are missing for police officers today, hear about what their needs are, and not have the assumption of, I know more than someone who's out there every day of the week. They tell me about the needs, and they tell me about the cuts back in 2009, and how to get back to that number, and they're hurting. They're hurting for police officers, they're hurting for some results, but they understand the time it takes to make sure that officers need to go th through the um, proper training. And so as we put officers in, we need to make sure that we are allocating overtime, we are talking to our neighborhood groups, we are making the small steps that give us feedback on a regular basis that helps community policing as we go through those steps prior to adding officers. It wasn't pie in the sky for me to add 50 officers. I said that with direction and I said it with a fund. To take money from the recreational marijuana tax and impact fee and to take it from the host fee of medical marijuana would help us to have officers back on the street over a four year period that would make a direct impact in our city so gunshots aren't being heard on a regular basis. Thank you. Ms. Scott Pacheco. The question was, what immediately will I do as your mayor to address public safety concerns and violent crime? And I completely hear this question. I live in the Flint neighborhood in one of the lowest uh, income areas in our city. Little unusual for a candidate for mayor to be residing there. 
And I know small businesses, residents, homeowners in the Flint and in so many areas in our city are very concerned about crime, are very concerned about opioids, and want to feel safe and live in a safe and clean neighborhood. So there's two steps that I will take immediately because I think, frankly, all of us agree that we need more capacity, but I have actual solutions on how to get there. So first, in my first month as your mayor, I will get rid of the special assistant. I do not need a special assistant. Jaisal Correa needed one and, and made a special assistant position after axing the neighborhood coordinator. I very much believe that we need a neighborhood coordinator to be that liaison, to be that link, to know about what issues are there in the neighborhoods and how can I, as your mayor, address those, neighbor, those neighborhood concerns, which is why we absolutely need a neighborhood coordinator to be back. The second way that I'm going to take immediate action as your mayor is to readjust how we are appropriating our CDBG, or Community Development Block Grant funding that we get from HUD, from Housing and Urban Development, or the feds. We are one of only eight communities in the entire United States that has a waiver that lets us spend above the limit on public services. I don't like this. CDBG funding is granted in part because of my neighborhood. It is only eligible for low-income census tracts, and you can use it for community policing. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make sure we're not funding public uh, services above and beyond the limit. That limit is there for a reason. We need to respect it. We need to not have a waiver, and we need to put that money where it's supposed to be, back into the neighborhoods. And that's what I'll do for you as your mayor. Thank you. Mr. Kamara. Thank you. In 2008, the city received nine C cuts from the state. If you remember, the state, the federal government was in trouble. We had nine C cuts. We had to ask every department head, every department in the city to take 8% cut. Most departments did, some didn't, so there had to be some layoffs. We've worked very hard since then to put police and fire back on the streets and back in uniform. We've also, to fight crime immediately, we introduced Operation Blue Thunder, where there was a number of people that were out there with warrants. We had to go find where they were. We put additional money into the overtime for the police department so we could track down those criminals, get them off the street, and put them behind bars where they belong. The problem that we have is the justice system, you can arrest someone and make a great case why they should go to jail longer, but they turn them over quicker, they're back on the streets before you know it. So we have to make sure if we want to protect the city, we have to put more police on the streets, and that's the bottom line, because criminal hate police officers and they hate police cruisers, and that's what you need to do. And the, it's very simple. The more police you have protecting the neighborhood, the better off we'll be. If we don't have a safe city, Nothing else matters, because people are not going to want to come here, and the people that are, going to, that are here are going to want to leave. It's a priority. It has to be taken care of, and we are addressing it. I'm very proud. Since 2008, every year, we've increased the complements of police officers and firefighters, and we'll continue to do that. It's not very difficult. There is money involved, but that's the recipe and the formula we need to do. More police presence in crime area, target the area where we know there's a lot of crime, go there as we, as we have done in the past. The last two incidents, the mayor's right, how do you stop one cousin from attacking another cousin and stabbing him? That's something that you can have police on every corner, that's still gonna happen. And when two individuals come out of the courthouse and they don't like each other and they have gang um, problems, they're gonna be shooting at each other. But the key to providing our city with a safe environment is Thank more you. police on the streets. Thank you. Time for one minute rebuttals, Mr. Coogan, if you'd like. If you notice in my answer, I relied on the people in Fall River to move us along. I think that the police, whether they're understaffed or not, the chief of police is going to tell us that he needs more people. But if we can re-engage, I just left Baresi Heights, and the people there were all concerned about the people out front using drugs, hanging around, they were willing to talk to me about it. Those are the kind of people we have to re-engage in Fall River and know that when they dial a number or they go to report a crime, someone's gonna show up quickly. If people have confidence in their ability to take care of their own neighborhoods, to call the police and they show up, there are going to be a bunch of eyes on the ground helping us. We need more eyes, more people confident in getting the respect they deserve when the police show up, and more people getting the criminals off the streets. Thank you. Mayor, one minute. Yep, so a couple of things. So just addressing a couple of um, Ms. Erica Scott Pacheco's uh, 
comments. So the $1.5 million transfer that you mentioned a couple questions ago in 16 the school department, I just want to make it clear, I became mayor in 16, in 2016, that was a carryover from the previous mayor. So that's very important that if you're going to talk about the facts, make sure you do give all of the facts. Secondly, I didn't create the special assistant position. That was the previous mayor that created the special assistant position. Now, a couple facts about the school department, excuse me, the police department. So dispatchers, very important, dispatchers, number of officers. So in 15, 228, 16, Sam Sutter said we were going to lay off 31 new officers if we didn't get a fee. In 17, now I'm, I become the mayor, 225, 18, 232, 19 this year, 237, and next year, 240 officers. I'm the only person with a proven track record of adding new, new police officers to the street. And we're going to add more overtime, more dispatchers like we've done. We've gone from 35 to 38, and we've proposed more. We propose and have now a crime analyst for the first time. Thank Those you. Those are the important Thank you. pieces. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Riley? Yes, just briefly, um, the impact of overtime is important. It's important in all our neighborhoods, though. I agree with Mr. Camaro who says we can't stop a shooting outside the courthouse. We can't predict that's going to happen. But we also, when a gun goes off on Snell Street, or goes off on Tecumseh Street, or goes off anywhere else, they need the overtime as well. It can't be focused just on downtown business. It's got to be throughout the city that we're supporting our citizens throughout. I know that neighborhood, right? I know the Snell Street. I know Tecumseh Street. It's things that happen like this or crime on a regular basis in that neighborhood, but the overtime wasn't there for them. I think it's impactful to add additional officers, but really impactful numbers. Our minimum is at 10 cars. If you go to New Bedford, it's at 20. We're not that much smaller. We really need to do, make the effort to find the resources, and if the marijuana doesn't pay for it, the sales tax doesn't pay for it, then we need to prioritize and make sure it's our first priority. Thank you. The budget. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Ms. Scott Pacheco. I don't need a special assistant. What I do need is for your tax dollars to go back to services for you. And that also includes infrastructure, which is something that none of my opponents on here have talked about. My campaign platform is linking public safety and infrastructure because you deserve a safe and clean neighborhood where the sidewalks and the roads are in good condition. That way, people will not be getting in car accidents, bicyclists, kids will not have to walk in the street because they'll be able to walk on the sidewalk. I ask why Jaisal Correa, in this year's budget, spent almost $8 million on streetscapes in bonding and only 450000 or 94% less on sidewalk bonding. I'm going to make good roads and good sidewalks a priority. We need to get back to basics, take care of all of the neighborhoods, not just the select few where campaign donors or supporters live in already pretty good neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kamara? Yeah, I just want to say, you know, I, I heard the mayor say that he's the only one that's putting more police in the streets. Well, I mean, I would like to think I'm part of that process as well, since I am a city councilor and we do approve those budgets. So I'm glad that we do that in partnership because that's what we need to do. Make sure that we do whatever it takes working together to protect our residents and our citizens, whether it's be more walking patrol officers, bike patrol officers, in cruises, increase the number of people that are doing that. It's something that I've been working at for a very long time. And to hear an individual say that he's the only one up here that has the solution that has been doing it, it's just not honest. And listen, I give him credit when he does things like that. I support it because we need to make sure that we realize we're all in this together. It's not one person taking the lead by himself, sailing that ship by himself. There's a lot of other people that take part in this and very fortunate and, and glad to be part of that. And I'm going to continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will be asked by Pamela Martin from Fall River Government Television and will be answered first by Mayor Correa. The State Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has identified Fall River as a school community with chronically absent children. If elected, you will be chairperson of the school committee. What are your ideas to improve attendance at all grade levels? Mayor Correa. Well, I'm currently the chairman of the school committee and uh, you know, I work with, uh, with my colleague to the right here. And and I'll, and I'll tell you, one of the things I do truly respect about Mr. Coogan is he has been an outstanding educator in our community, and he's an outstanding colleague on the, on the school committee. I think this uh, administration, in partnership with him and our other colleagues, have done an outstanding job for our, uh, our community uh, in terms of education. That's been a problem that goes back in, in, in larger scope 
uh, to the former superintendent, something that we're working to address in terms of absenteeism within our community, within our classrooms. And I think that that's, uh, that's also a, a home issue, right? It's very important that families, parents at home uh, really play a role in their child's life in Fall River. Uh, you know, many of the members here on, on the stage, a couple of them, have, uh, have wonderful families, and they've been instrumental in their children's lives. My parents have been instrumental in my life. So we have to make sure that parents have resources, and that's why I have been a huge supporter, and we continue to support our Parents Learning Center through the school department. That's one way to encourage families to make sure that they have the resources they need at home to make sure their children show up to school on or in class. Another important thing is to make sure that our students feel loved within the classroom. Make sure that they feel that they are valued. That's so important to our children. And under this superintendent, Malone, he's done a fabulous job with all the teachers throughout our department in doing that. That's so, so vital. So ensuring that we can continue to give resources so the school department doesn't have to fight with the city council and say, oh, you owe me money or you owe me this, this. That's what was going on in the past. Today, the superintendent just proposed his budget. I've never heard of a budget with 65 new positions being proposed. That means continued reduction in classroom sizes, which this administration has accomplished with my colleague. That means more teachers throughout our community, more paraprofessionals, more training, more, more services for kids. So I think that we're heading in the right direction uh, with the parent learning services, as well as ensuring that smaller classroom sizes. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. Mr. Riley. Thank you, and thanks for the question, Pam. I, you know, in my wheelhouse with education, um, part of my career in education has been working in um, both suburban and urban communities. I mentioned briefly before about being a principal in New Bedford of an alternative school. One of the first problems that we had there was kids didn't show up. We had 50% attendance on a daily basis. I was put in to fix the problem, correct it, think about new solutions on how to, how to make kids feel good, how do they get engaged in school. Kids show up when they're engaged. The first thing we did was develop two programs, not one. Make sure that our kids who had uh, behavioral um, issues were not the ones that were sitting next to our kids who were um, struggling with social emotional issues. They didn't mix, they never did. We separated that class, we turned around and said, we need them to be in separate buildings. We need to give them skills that make them happy every day to come to school. Um, to someone who just said it, it might have been the mayor, that they need to be loved. At the end of the day, I knew my kids were loved because we had a culinary department in our school. We were lucky for the facility that we had. We made sure that our kids had skills, but also that we, we utilized their skills to make dinners for the parents so the parents would come in as well, to make sure that they got involved, um, to make sure that our attendance was going to go up. This was a good group of people that came together to make sure that kids came first. In that opportunity, if you go back and look at those um, days in my second year and third year and fourth year of principal, over 90% attendance of the schools. Unheard of, 40% increase in attendance, but it was because we loved kids and made sure they were engaged every day and make sure they were learning something that meant to them and they were going to take that education and get back to a regular public school setting where they get their diploma. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Scott Pacheco. We have a lot of disparities in our educational system in Fall River. As a product of K-12 public schools and as the daughter of a public school teacher, my mom who's here in the audience today, this is a really top issue for me. It's clear that when school districts fail, they don't only fail individual students, they fail the entire community. And it's also clear that high quality educational opportunities have to be an, a reality for low income children, children with disabilities, English language learners, and children of color who comprise about 50% of our public school district. That's why some concrete solutions that I have for addressing absenteeism include providing universal breakfast and lunch. Now, Last year, not wearing my campaign hat and my work hat, because those are two different roles in my life, my work advocated for the school, ch uh, school committee, of which I will be chair as your mayor, to apply to the state and actually earn and generate revenue through a federal uh, program where they'll give us a certain amount of money so that every single kid can get free breakfast and lunch. We're not doing that right now, we're eligible. It would be a revenue generator because the amount of money they allocate per kid is actually more than what we would spend 
other cities do it, all of our sister cities do it, and we're eligible to do it. And for whatever reason, the school committee chose not to do it. So what does that mean? That means you have kids who may be coming to school with hungry bellies. There may be kids, a kid who has to get themselves out of bed, get their siblings ready for school, maybe because mom and dad are hooked on opioids or dad is incarcerated. And when those kids get to school, if they're hungry, are they really ready to learn? If they're late because they were trying to get food, are they ready to learn? The second way that I want to address this is by not encouraging court involvement for absenteeism. There's something called a school to prison pipeline that perpetuates intergenerational cycles of poverty and incarceration in our city. Thank There's you. There's no reason that we have Thank to you. refer these kids to court. Thank you. Mr. Kamara. Thank you. That's an excellent question. When I used to take my daughter, Brianna, to school at the Cuss Middle School, I would stop along the way and pick up two other students that didn't have a way to get to school. Those two students became number one and number two at Durfee High School when they graduated. We don't know what these kids are going home to. We don't know what happens when they wake up in the morning. We don't know what ha they have to eat before they go to bed at night. There are so many problems out there. The reason I would go to pick up these two students is because they had one car in the family and the father had to give the mother a right ride to work and then go to work himself and he didn't have the time to take his children to school. So there are a lot of issues out there. I've also remember when I would see kids waiting for the bus and it's raining out and the bus stop had no shelter and these kids would be soaking wet, they didn't have an umbrella, they couldn't afford one. They'd be soaking wet and I could see the kids walking back home because they're not gonna go to school soaking wet. What are they gonna do? And I've had teachers tell me that some of the kids would go to school where there was water dripping on the floor because they were soaking wet in the first, home, first period of the day. So there's things that we need to do as a community to address the bus stop situation. There should be a shelter at every bus stop in the city. I fought to put the bus stop shelter that's at BMC Durfee High School about four or five years ago because there was not one there and I would drive by and see kids in the pouring rain, in the snow, with no shelter, waiting for a bus before school, waiting for a bus after school. Those are the type of things that make people not want to go to school. And again, it's, it starts at the home. If the parents are able to get them there, that's one thing. But transportation is a big issue for these people. Sometimes they just can't afford to have a car. So they rely on someone else or finding a way for their kids to get to school. And that's something that we should do a better job of. And as mayor, I'm going to continue to do a better job of that to make it as easy as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Coogan. Okay. Uh, school attendance in Fall River has been a long standing battle that we fight every day. There are a number of things going on, I believe, that we do give the kids. I know we did at Durfee free breakfast and free lunch every day, and there's a number of programs throughout the district. And unless I'm wrong, I think every kid has the opportunity for free breakfast and free lunch every day. Maybe it's not the program that um, one of my colleagues on the stage brought up, but we do feed them every day, so that's not quite accurate. Second of all, um, chronic truants go to court, I think it's still a $25 fine. I don't want them fined. I want parents to go to classes where they find out how important school attendance is to try to flip the switch. We'd get kids coming into Durfee, they'd roll up on us with three, 400 days absent from their first eight years of school. Those students need additional supports, which as the mayor said, are gonna be in the next year's budget. There are other things we can do. Encourage after school activities. Those kids seem to come and stay longer. We can push the students in the classrooms. When they're getting the proper instruction, they're more likely to attend. But these long-term, hardcore, chronic students need a lot of support. It's funny, though, that my colleague, he and I do work very well together on the school committee, but he doesn't always show up himself. He's missed four meetings, he's left early six or eight of them, and it's my position that we model good attendance. When I was at Durfee, I showed up every day. I gave back my personal days. I knew that in attendance is that important. As the chairman of the school committee, I will be at every single meeting, unless, God forbid, something happens to me with my health. Second of all, the Durfee Building Project. The mayor and I are both on that committee. I was, he was kind enough to appoint me in January to fill in for Eddie Costa when he left. He's never attended one meeting. He's never showed up in a meeting. We meet at Durfee every Thursday. Uh, my colleague to the right, Mr. Kamara, tries to make as many as he can. And I don't expect him to sit there Thank every you. meeting. Thank you. But they should Thank you, try Mr. To Coogan. Make it. Thank you. One minute rebuttals now, Mayor Correa. Okay, so 
a lot to rebut, so I want to bring up some other stuff. But I do think it's important to just clear the record. Um, so Mr. Coogan is correct. You know, certainly there are times when you're the mayor that you know, you're not just a school committee member, you're not just the chairman of the school committee. You've got many, many responsibilities throughout the community. Uh, so that's, that's that. It's, there, I, it's impossible for the mayor to attend every single meeting all the time everywhere. And secondly, in terms of the building committee for Durfee High School, these two gentlemen to my right both asked me to appoint them to this committee. I did. I wanted them to be my surrogates, my individuals that would come back to me, and they did, uh, with information about the building committee. That's once again another area that, you know, I trusted these individuals to, to get the job done. And guess what? We all together as a community got the job, job done. We're building a new Derby High School, and that's a really exciting part of, uh, of what we've accomplished. So to throw out, oh, well, you missed this thing or you missed that, let's look at the facts. Let's look at the record. We got everything that we needed to do done. And occasionally, by the way, I set the, I set the agenda on the school committee, so I can set the date. But in order to not hold up business, I have passed it to my very capable colleague, Thank Mark you. Costa, the vice Thank chair, you, Mayor. to run those meetings. Thank you very much. And I couldn't to continue Thank you. the state of business. Thank you. Mr. Riley. Thank you. So last week I had an opportunity to um, go talk about teacher retention at Leslie University. They have a facility, the DeMello International Center, uh, in New Bedford, it was really to talk about teacher retention. And I don't put attendance on teacher retention, but I was really curious about what would come out of that meeting. It was a facility that has had partnered with New Bedford Public Schools and would love to partner with the Fall River Public Schools. They do quite a few things. One is they engage parents and help parents help their own children. Two is they make sure that those critical needs, those teachers that are certified in special education, in ESL, that they complete their certification, and we keep a feeder system going. When we have good teachers, like we do, but make sure that we have an abundance in those fields, the kids will show up, they'll stay engaged, and they'll come to school happy, ready to learn. Thank you. Ms. Scott Pacheco? I'm really perplexed by a few things that my opponents on stage said. I'm confused how Jaisal Correa is claiming his administration is championing school funding and 65 new positions next year when that funding is coming from the state, thanks to a readjustment in Chapter 70 funding. And our state partners have been asking for him to resign. Mr. Riley described working in New Bedford a simple Google search and review of articles from the newspaper there showed that he was in administration at West Side High that was shut down due to allegations of warehousing children with disabilities and children of color and locking them in a timeout closet. The school shut down, later reopened, even changed its name to Trinity Day Academy due to the negative perception in the community. In terms of Mr. Coogan, well, my organization, Coalition for Social Justice, and Mass Law Reform Institute all spoke with Superintendent Malone about the benefit of doing Thank you. A universal Thank lunch, you. and that has just happened. Thank you very much. Mr. Kamara? Thank you. I just want to state for the record, in 23 years of my service as a city council, I've missed five meetings. Twice I was out of the country, once my father's funeral, my father's wake, and two other times I was sick, so sick I couldn't get out of bed, so I couldn't make my city council meeting. But five meetings in 23 years is pretty good. As far as, um, I'm the co-chair of the BMC Durfee New High School as well, and as far as not making those meetings, I make m almost all of those meetings. The only ones that I don't go to on a regular basis are the 9 o'clock meetings on a Wednesday to hear about how many s tons of soil are being removed. Right now, they're taking soil out of the ground and they're putting in utilities. I'm in the construction industry. We don't need to be at those meetings. There's nothing more than removal of soil and putting in the utilities. So I make all of my meetings proud of that. It's important to be there because here on the committee and you should serve. But the mayor's right. We do talk about what's going on. And if he has other responsibilities, I don't blame him for that. Um, but I just want to point out the fact that it's important for me to be there. Thank you. So I'm there. Thank you. Mr. Coogan? I just want, I just want to state this clearly. When I was criticizing the mayor for his attendance, it was because he doesn't show up at all. He hasn't been to one building meeting, and I know what it's like for him. He should be able to come in, spend a half hour, get the lay of the land, and ask us later what went on. That's fair. I don't expect him to sit there. Some of those meetings uh, we're at go an hour, hour and a half, two hours, and I know he has a ton of responsibilities. As far as missing the school committee meetings, if he's got those kind of conflicts, as he said, he sets the schedule. 
We're more than accommodating to work with him if he can't make it, but it is important that he be there because he is the chairman. And a lot of times we have discussions in executive session that impact things, and he's already left for the night. It's my position that being there matters, and if I'm your mayor, I will schedule the uh, school committee meetings and the executive session meetings so I can stay and do the work of protecting and, and helping our students in the schools. Thank you. Our next question will be asked by Don Amata from FRC Media and will be first answered by Kyle Riley. So far, you've all talked about your qualifications, saying you're the best. So far, you've all said you're the most trustworthy. So far, you haven't really talked about respect for each other or for perhaps the people who are listening. My question is this. Only one of you could be elected in March. Everyone else will go away. Good characteristic of a leader is to show confidence in other people. If you had to, if you didn't win, and you had to choose someone on this floor right here, all these candidates, who would you work the best with? Who's the most like you? And who would you support as you left the mayor's office? Mr. Riley, thank you. Please, thank you. Please, Mr. Riley, two minutes. So I got the easy question to start off with, right? Um, I can't start off with your question because I need to use some of my time to rebut um, what Erica said in her last comments. I don't want facts to get in the way of your statement. You're right. All you need is a Google search and you'll find out that the superintendent came over to Keith Middle School as I was the assistant principal and said, we have a problem over the alternative school, please come fix it. That's when I started there to fix the problem that was there. When I walked in, I got together with staff, teachers, and said, Westside High is an alternative name. It's a gang name. We're changing this name. And I got together with kids who changed the name with me. So you can do your Google search. Just make sure you're talking about the right people when you do it. When it comes to respect, I think I started off my first statement in saying that I believe in my heart of hearts that everyone up here must love this city if they're sitting here. I do respect the others. I think we have different qualifications, different backgrounds. I think we're running maybe for different reasons. It would be, I thought your question was going in a different direction and say we're gonna run or not again, but I really, when you sit down and listen to each and every one of these candidates that decided me, it is still not done in this race to pick somebody to say, I line up perfectly with that person. I wanna hear tonight, there's two more debates coming forward. I know that people on this board care about education. That's important to me. I know there's people on this table that care tremendously about public safety. And I think that's the first piece for me that we need to get back in control. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna fail at this. I'm not gonna pick somebody for you. But as the process goes, like the process I ask for everybody else out there, look at people's resume, listen to what they're saying, watch every interview and watch these debates and you'll find the person that you connect with. We'll do the same thing, I'm sure. Thank you. Ms. Scott Pacheco. Very interesting question. So I did state in one of my previous answers that I'm not here to argue about who has more integrity. And I stated what I truly do believe, that all of my opponents care about the city and that we have different visions. So in terms of uh, who would I pick? I mean, I think I under understood your question to be, Donna, like who would I pick as a co-mayor? Is that the question? Who would I pick instead of me? If you did not win, if I did not who win. would you support and think is most qualified? Okay, so if I did not win, let me make it really clear to the voters and to the viewers at home. If I do not win the recall, which is a reality, it's a winner take all, we have a large field, there's five of us, and it's a reality that someone could win with maybe 20% of the vote. If I did not win, March 13th, I'll probably take off, but March 14th, I'll be doing the same thing I did today, the same thing I'm doing tomorrow. I'll be going to work, and I will run again in the fall to serve you as your mayor, because I think that the issues that I'm elevating in my platform, especially around housing, affordable housing, not pricing anyone out, and not only market rate housing, I think that those are the issues that the voters of Fall River are most concerned about. If I had to pick someone else, I will say, obviously, I was a volunteer with the recall. I stood in front of markets throughout the city because I, like the thousands of voters who signed that petition, I'm extremely concerned and disturbed about Jaisal Correa's 13 federal indictments. I think they relate directly to his ability to serve as mayor. To this day, he is still signing contracts, 
financial instruments, checks, while he's under indictment for tax evasion or tax fraud and wire fraud. And so I think that his argument, that's his personal life, it's his business life, um, it bleeds through to the current professional role in which he serves as your mayor. And so that's why if I am not elected as your mayor in the recall, I hope that one of my other opponents who is challenging the incumbent wins. And either way, win or lose, I'll be running again in the fall. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kamara. So if no one else is going to answer the question, why should I? Right? <laughs> I mean, let's face it. One. Thank you. Please. Let's just be honest. Please, right? thank you. I mean, I was born at night, but I wasn't born last night. So, look, let's face it, okay? I've worked with everybody up here. Mr. Riley and I served on the city council together. He voted for me to be president of the council. The mayor and I served on the council together. He voted for me to be president of the council. Mr. Coogan hasn't run for city council yet, but when he does, I'm sure he'll vote for me to be president of the council as well. <laughs> and, and Mrs. Smart, I, I don't know when she's going to run for council. I think you might have run in the past, though. I'm not sure. But anyways... I have a good working relationship with everybody. And even my colleagues that are there now, in the local level, school committee men, city councilors, state representatives, congressmen, Bonnie Frank, Jim McGovern, I've had an excellent working relationship with everybody. I'm not here to put people down. I want to build bridges. I don't want to fight with people over no reason. I'll fight against people that are coming to this community causing less harm. But I'll work with every single elected official, whether it's a he or she, to help this community move forward. That's your answer to the question. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Coogan. Uh, I, thought the question, I thought the question was someone on the stage that we'd pick to work with. Um, I'd probably pick uh, Lynn Sullivan because if she, can, <laughs> if she can live with Greg, she's got the grit and fortitude that I'm looking for to be successful in government center. But really, <laughs> put that... Um, when, I look at the, when I look at the candidates on this stage and I have to pick one of them, I think I would pick a little piece of each one of them. If I picked Erica, it was because she went to Harvard. I couldn't get in there. I respect her for that. If I picked Kyle, it was because he has six children. I left the kids at 2.30 because I went home shaking like a leaf. If it was Jaisal, it's because of his hair because I'm losing most of mine. And if it was Joe, it would be because of his longevity and he's able to stick in there and do the job. I think when you take a little bit of the traits of all of us, that's how you get your best candidate to work with. But again, my pick would be Lynn Sullivan because of that in the front row. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Mayor Correa. Huh. Well, we got some great answers here tonight. <laughs> I, do, I do like my hair, Paul. There you go. I gave you credit. I gave <laughs> you can borrow it. <laughs> Probably will so, in a few years. <laughs> so I found a few grays, finally. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, the, answer, the answer is, of course, uh, I have already worked with everybody in some capacity on this stage, um, and I would do that uh, as the continued mayor of the city of Fall River. Uh, the mayor, you know, at times um, certainly doesn't agree with everybody. I certainly don't agree with everybody, but I try and be a sponge. One of the things that people do know about me is I do listen to a lot of different people. I still make the decision. And that's what people elect me to do. At the end of the day, I am the one that has to make the decision because I'm responsible to the people of Fall River. I work for you. So I'm the one that should be making the decision um, and take full responsibility for those decisions, whether they're good or bad. But I listen to all my colleagues who want to listen. It is a partnership. But let's make no mistake about it. There are people that don't want to work with me, not because of what's going on, but before what was going on. Let's make no mistake about it. There are people on our current city council, there are people in this community that didn't get something from this administration, there are people that have personal agendas and vendettas that have not wanted to see me move this city forward. And despite their desire not to move the city forward, not Jaisal Correa's life forward, the city forward, we have still moved the city forward. We have still eliminated the fees. We have still added more police and firefighters. We have still reduced classroom sizes. We have still increased funding to our our school department, and we're still doing so much more around infrastructure and economic development. So I have an open door policy. I want to work with anyone, my enemies to my best friends, to move this community forward, because that is my job. My job is to do that. It's not to keep vendettas or grudges. It's to move the city forward. But when somebody wants to move the city backward, or they want to have their personal agenda move forward, guess what? That, I'm here to be the check and balance and to stop Thank that. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. 
One minute rebuttals, if you'd like, Mr. Riley. I would say in the sake of not changing direction and uh, not repeating myself for this question, I'll forego my rebuttal. Thank you. Ms. Scott Pacheco, one minute. I don't have all of the answers. No human being does. The one thing that I can promise you, whoever I am working with, I'm not going to arbitrarily term some people enemies, talk about vendettas, because we all have something to contribute. Just like was described, we all have great attributes, and, and that extends to you, the voters, and the residents of Fall River. Jason Korea talked about he wants to move the city forward in the same breath, he's talking about very negative vendettas and enemies in this talk. I ask, who are we moving Fall River forward for? I promise you, the voters, I will not leave anyone behind. I will not be moving the city forward just for my friends, for my campaign supporters. I will not be handing out $10,000 snow stipends for three days of work. I will not be giving $3,000 to my good friend and mentor to go stay at the Ritz-Carlton. I'm going to move Fall River forward for everyone. I will not leave you behind, and I will not bring this negativity into the sixth floor as your mayor. Thank you. Please, please, thank you. Mr. Kamara. If you'd like one minute. I'm going to forego it as well. Okay. Mr. Coogan? Uh, I, um, I'll stay with my answer. Lynn Sullivan. Thank you. <laughs> our next question will be asked by Lynn Sullivan. And it will be first answered by Erica Scott Pacheco. With the removal of the pay as you throw trash disposal program, and in the interest of fiscal responsibility, what will you do to raise revenue for the city and avoid raising taxes and fees? Scott Pacheco, two minutes. Can you repeat the question, Lynn, please? Sure. I'm sorry. With the removal of the pay-as-you-throw trash disposal program, and in the interest of fiscal responsibility, what will you do to raise revenue for the city and avoid raising taxes and fees? Ms. Scott Pacheco. So before Jaisal Correa fulfilled an 11th hour campaign promise as a desperate political move to get votes, I was also campaigning on the goal to eliminate the purple bags I originally was in favor of them. I thought they promoted recycling, but I heard from so many people, so many voters like you at home on fixed incomes or people who said it was a struggle because they were poor quality, the bags were breaking. And so I changed my mind and I use that as an example of how I do listen and I will be responsive to your needs. My goal was to use the revenue from the recreational cannabis. I spoke with uh, Cannabis Control Commissioner Jennifer Flanagan to have an understanding to do the research and to find out that the local tax revenue we could use to supplant the revenue from the purple bags. But that still leaves my main concern, which is recycling. So on July 11, 2018, Kathy Ann Vivier, city administrator, said that contaminated recycling bins are a major problem for the city and not just under the purple bag system beforehand. But then on February 2nd, she stated that residents are no longer required to use purple bags and the bags were contributing to the contamination of the recyclables. So she actually let go, or, or not let go, she repurposed the four checkers who were making sure that we could get a handle on this contaminated recycling. Now, it was nice to see that they're going to be doing sidewalk and pothole repair, as that is my platform, so I was glad that Jaisal Correa is adopting some of my platform, but the recycling contamination still remains. We're paying about $100 a ton to pay for contaminated recycling and about $82 a ton for solid waste. It should be the other way around. We're having to throw away our recycling. I'm a very strong proponent of the environment, and that's why we need to do an educational campaign on the do's and the don'ts of recycling. I note that we got a grant to do a mail to all households, and it thank never you. went out. Thank you very much. Mr. Kamara. Oh, thank you. So the bags are gone. I've never supported the bags. I, I've never once voted in favor of them, and I'm certainly not going to bring them back. They're gone. The key is a transfer station. We, the voters voted for a transfer station. We have the ability to do that. All we have to do is get into an agreement with a company that wants to either run it ourselves or maybe have someone else run it for us as we do with the waste treatment program and just have the trash come in, sort it out, and then transfer it out. It's a very simple process. Other communities are doing it. They save an awful lot of money that way, and you don't need an incinerator or a landfill to do it. Um, and that's the best way to do it. 
Last year, the money from the purple bags was never used. It went into the stabilization account because we didn't use any of that money. So to say that we need the revenues from the bags, we don't. Last year, we were able to balance the budget without the revenues from the purple bags, and I believe that the mayor's crafting a budget now. Um, I have no reason to believe that that can't happen again. We haven't been given a budget, but I'm sure that we've been told by now that we're going to be short $2 million that are generated in revenue um, because that's something that we should know. But considering last year's budget, we didn't use a penny from the purple bags revenue. It, it, it made perfectly sense. As I have said all along, when it was put in place, we don't need the revenues. We have close to seven or eight million dollars in stabilization account, and that's plenty of money to go forward. And we can actually, we don't have to reduce taxes at a full two and a half percent, because when you have that much money in stabilization account, you're doing pretty good. And I've always been against former mayors when they say they inherit a six million dollar deficit and we're in trouble. I was the one that was the biggest uh, opponent of former Mayor Sutter when he was giving his speech how he inherited a six million dollar deficit. I told him it wasn't true. I told him he had to stop saying it, but he wouldn't listen and he kept saying it to everybody. But he could never identify where that deficit was. So with that, that's the key, transfer station. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Coogan. Yeah. Um, I, I too am not bringing back the bags. Um, there's no interest in that. And I'll go along with uh, the mayor's budget. And if the money is not necessary, let's go forward. But taxes and fees are going up. A friend of mine lives around the corner from me on um, Kenyon Street. And since 2016, her residential tax bill has gone up $641. So to say, well, we're not using that money, we're not we are using that money, but we're using it and taking it a different way right out of residential taxes. It's my position that is. Fall River grows when you look at the uh, developments behind Royal Crest or you look at the development out on Highland Avenue and new revenues come in from residential growth. Hopefully money does come in from marijuana sales and hopefully when sports gambling gets going, we're gonna get a, sh a bigger share of the pie. Those monies can be used to offset that. I do like uh, <coughs> the gentleman on my right and I know the gentleman on my left do support a transfer station in Fall River and have had some discussions about that with companies that are able to do those kind of things. It's my position, we don't need the revenue from the bags, let's simplify it and put it in the taxes, that's A-OK -okay with me. Also, as we move forward and our budget grows, we need to be able to get the state following the model they did with the schools where they increased the funding formula. Our foundation money went up a lot this year. Um, it's gonna be like $8 million, which is why we're talking about those increased positions. Maybe we can get the state to readjust their funding formula mechanism to help um, the gateway cities further because of the amount of low income, high needs population we have, and then maybe we'll get ourselves back on track. I do believe we're there, but I think we can do better. Thank you. Mayor Correa. So there's a lot of work to still be done. You know, I'm certainly not done with some of the things that I've uh, begun. Um, so a couple things on this topic. Number one, very simple. All you have to remember is if you don't want another fee, vote for me, Jaisal Carrera. I'm the only one that's proven, the only mayor in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that's proven to get rid of fees. The only one. So we got rid of the trash fee. We got rid of the... Um, $120 trash fee, we got rid of the pay-as-you-throw program, and we're looking at other fees. We're looking at the stormwater fee. Although, every time I mention elimination of any fee, my entire staff goes, oh my goodness, what's he up to now? But guess what? We set a goal, we work with our department heads, we work with our departments to make sure they have what they need first, and we build that trust, and then we build the budget around the needs of this community. That's what we do. We don't take extra money for the, from the taxpayers if we don't need to. We've returned money to the taxpayers and made it more convenient. The purple bags were an inconvenience. We got rid of it. But the new revenue streams, every single person so far has talked about the things that this administration has started. Cannabis, that's us. We started that. So the cannabis industry, we ensure that there would be uh, opportunities for the city to achieve that revenue stream. The transfer station, we initiated that process. We've met with numerous companies and we're going to build a transfer station here in the city. Uh, billboards, we're working on the billboard revenue. So we have done all these things and the, my colleagues here on the stage are just saying, well, Mr. Kamara said, for example, uh, well, yeah, it's great, we have $8 million. That's right, this administration got $8 million. Th yeah, they're talking about the things that we have done, and we're only going to continue doing that under this administration. So when you think of fees, think about my other opponents. When you want to think about no new fees, think of Jay Zulkerer, because I have the proven track record to have done it. I've done it, I'm going to do it again, and I want to outdo myself on that particular topic. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Riley. 
Thank you. I'm not sure when you think of fees why you think of the other opponents, except that um, some of us are homeowners and we've been paying those fees right along. Um, transfer station is something that's been proposed here in the city. It's been proposed um, during the Lambert administration and didn't come forward. I too agree with the, what a transfer, transfer station brings to the city. It gives us an opportunity to move trash in and out and not leave it here in our city that we've chose to do in the past. It also is a part of, a small part of regionalization. We could talk about regionalization for a lot of different topics, but the trash piece, if we're up and going with a transfer station, certainly allows us the benefit of moving trash in and moving trash out for a fee for other communities to make sure that our rates are better than any other rate in, in surrounding communities. For me, um, it was always oversight was the problem with the purple bags and the pay-as-you-throw program. It wasn't just that, it was an inconvenience. It was. I, too, was not bringing back purple bags as mayor, but it was neighbors who talked to me or people I knocked on the door who came back to me and said, you know, I wasn't using mine or I didn't want to use mine because the person next door chose not to. Why are they not fined? Why are they not um, accountable for their actions? The one way we bring fees, um, bring fees, you got me thinking about fees. The, uh, <laughs> the one way that we bring new revenue is really about economic development and bringing those pieces of educational attainment, of more police on the streets, and to bring economic development to our city by making ourselves friendly to um, businesses out there that want to come here, but maybe not making those choices right now. Thank you. One minute rebuttal time, Ms. Scott Pacheco. Let me be clear. There is no single issue that Jaisal Correa has politicized more than trash. He is not making decisions to serve you. He is making decisions to serve himself. He said that, for instance, cannabis revenue was something he did. Well, let's also not forget the fact that he received $20,000 to his legal defense fund and within four days, that cannabis company that gave him that money had a permission letter to locate here in the city. Pay to play, you decide. He said he's going to outdo himself. I frankly am petrified at the thought and I cannot imagine <laughs> what further uh, how further he can politicize this issue. I'm tired of it, you're tired of it, we deserve better, that's why I'm running for mayor. I'm not going to stand up here and make promises. I'm not going to stand up here and hold trump cards at the 11th hour and play games because frankly, thank you. Thank you. We're sick of it. One minute, Mr. Kamara. Yeah. To my colleague, Mr. Coogan, he talks about someone and they tell you, and they've said it to me too, you know, I keep paying more money, more money, more money. My, my va the reason that people pay more money in taxes, not just because of 2.5%, but also there was a double whammy when the property values went up. Everyone's property value went up. That's good for Fall River when your property value goes up. And you know, the mayor says he's the only one on here that's eliminated fees. Last time I checked, within the last three years, I know the stormwater fee went up. Today he's saying he wants to eliminate the stormwater fee, but that'd be nearly impossible until the stormwater debt is paid off. So I think you raised the stormwater fee, Mayor, if I, correct, if I recall correctly, um, but you can rebut it if you didn't. I, I'm almost positive you didn't. Another thing, we did say there's a seven, eight million dollar stabilization account, and let's not forget, that's still taxpayer money. We're overtaxing people. When the two and a half percent kicks in, the property value goes up, and we continue to have seven to eight million dollars in the stabilization account, maybe it's time to do as the former mayor career did Thank you. and lower the fee. Thank lower you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Coogan. Uh, I, I just have a couple of things. The taxes jumped last year of 18 to 19 because of the reevaluation in the property. But before that, they were running along at a pretty steady clip of the 2.5%. Um, in response to what Ms. Scott said about the money when uh, our mayor brought up the uh, cannabis money, those checks that went to him didn't stay in Fall River. They didn't pay for Maplewood Little League. They didn't pay for youth soccer. They went directly to Boston lawyers. That money that he collected to sign a contract to allow these plants to open in Fall River, which I support with him, should have stayed in the community and helped the people here. 
Taking it in an envelope to send to Boston lawyers is my idea of nothing. If he had left the money in the community, he would have got no flack for it. But when you take the money and send it up the road to pay for lawyers that are working exclusively for you, it does nothing to help the city of Fall River. Thank you. Mayor Correa. Okay. Thank you. So, a couple of things. Uh, Mr. Kamara, I believe you voted for that fee, stormwater fee increase. Yeah, so, you did. And... And, and you voted to create the stormwater <coughs> fee. Absolutely. Okay. So when we talk about fees, you, are, you have a track record of creating or, or voting for fee increases. So that's first of all, most important. I have a track record of eliminating fees. So we all know, we all know it's important to continue to run city government. We've got to run it responsibly. That's what this administration has done. Mr. Kamara says, well, the $8 million in stabilization funds, you know, are the people's money. All of the money is the people's money. All of it. But guess what? If you don't have money in your stabilization account, you end up in the situation we were in three years ago with mayors saying that we're on the brink of receivership, layoffs to police and fire, pink slips going to our teachers, and that, once again, is the biggest black cloud over this community. And that's going to repeat itself if we don't set things straight like we've done over the last three years. That's what I've done every single day. My opponents, they want to talk about, uh, you know, these little other issues that they want to bring up, but I haven't heard a platform. I haven't heard what they're going to do for you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Riley? I would just add that building the relationships that were here in the past with our federal delegation, our state delegation, is a way for us to make sure that we are talking about unfunded mandates that are put on the city. And we're there since the CSO project started uh, with the EPA mandating us to make sure that our pipes are um, being restored, that we are under the gun for a lot of unfunded mandates at the same exact time. We need some relief for that. We can get relief by building those relationships at the federal level. We've heard from a couple of candidates tonight, we've heard from the people themselves. They're having a difficult time working with this administration with those other things that are going on. We need to rebuild those relationships and make sure that we have those to move forward and remove some of the burden on the taxpayers of Fall River. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will be asked by Sue Netter and will be answered first by Council Camara. This recall election has been rather emotionally charged with varying degrees of attacks both on social media and sometimes on the radio. Opposing sides seem unwilling to partake in civil discourse. The city council is at odds with the administration, the voters are at odds with each other, and as a result, Fall River is greatly divided. How will you unify the city? Mr. Camara. Are you talking about Donald Trump or are you talking about the city of Fall River? I mean, listen, we, we live in a, in, a, in a different world now. And social media is something that I, I choose not to participate in, although I do have a Facebook page now, and I'm hearing it's getting a lot of activity. But anyway, I, I don't like to take part in that stuff. I like to stay away from the drama. I don't, I don't go to the city council meetings looking to pick a fight or fight with my colleagues or anyone else. I ask questions of the administration, they give me the answers. If I don't like the answers, then I vote accordingly. So I think that it's important for people to realize that we're all up here because we want to do best for the city. And they're all out there because they want to make sure that whoever they choose is doing best for the city. Like I said earlier, we're all in this together. I'm more of a team player than anything else. I've participated in sports my entire life. And I've always been about working together as a team to get stuff done. I would rather not make a comment than to criticize something, someone for something that they're doing or something that they said. I just vote appropriately. That's all I do. Because at the end of the day, I do have a vote. And I will sit there, and if I don't like what I'm being told, I don't like what I'm, being, what I'm hearing, and if I know it's not accurate or truthful, I'll just vote against it. It's very simple. Other people want to take it to the next level and continue to argue and fight, and that's been going on in city council since way before I was there, and it's going to happen since way after I'm gone. That's the nature of the business. As I said, something that we're seeing at the local level, at the state level, in the federal level, it's all over the place. People feel, and it's unfortunate, that it's easier to kick down someone than it is to build them up. And that's not my style, that's not who I am. I've never beat up a department head over any issue. If I disagree with that department head, like I said, I vote accordingly. I voted against a lot of budgets mayors have put forward, I vote in favor of them. As far as the fee that the mayor says I voted for and implemented, I did. I voted for the stormwater fee to help people keep their homes and stop the water and sewer rates from quadrupling. Those fees, Thank that you. stormwater fee was Thank necessary. You. Thank you. Mr. Coogan. Okay. This is very basic to me. The leader sets the tone. 
the leader sets the tone. In Fall River, my colleague on the uh, left of me has turned politics on their head when I, talk, when I talk about things like setting up a fake wood website to attack a reporter, taking a 77-year-old disabled veteran and pulling his constable license, um, having the police go to places. Please, please. It's my position that, that our leader is a young man who doesn't understand how you build teams. If I'm elected mayor of this city, I will, I will be out in the neighborhood associations, out in the city buildings, out working in the high rises, I will be out and about. And many, many, many of the people on his campaign, I still call friends of mine. My, my campaign, one of the people at the beginning wrote some pretty vulgar words one day on Facebook. I told him, next time you do that, you are gone. I don't want to see that kind of politics. I think that you rebuild the city by working with people. I'm not going to have any trouble when this is over working with Jaisal Carrere. If he wins or I win, and you have my word on that, we're going to move the city forward. Right now we're in a battle and things are being said to point out each other's weaknesses. Everyone on the stage is doing it. But if you want to have a leader that sets a tone and takes the city to another level, then I respectfully ask you give me a vote on the 12th and you'll see the difference in this style of leadership versus our present mayors. Thank you. Mr. Correa. So, you know, I think, I think Mr. Coogan's completely right in terms of the relationship we continue to have. You know, we read each other on a campaign trail. We still go to our school committee meetings. Uh, we haven't had a single, single issue. And I don't think you disagree with that. Uh, in terms of, you know, saying I'm a young man who doesn't know how to build teams, that is literally all I've done uh, over the last three years in terms of, uh, of our cities moving forward. It is undeniable that the city has moved forward. I don't think even my opponents disagree that the record speaks for itself. Mr. Coogan, in his opening remarks, said that I was going to list uh, a laundry list of my accomplishments. And I have done a little bit of that. But guess what? Every single one of those accomplishments are not for Jaisal Carrere. They're for the city of Fall River. They're for you. They're for the taxpayers, the renters, the homeowners, the businesses, the small businesses. I have a list here of the small businesses that have opened in the last six months in our community. This list of businesses, small community businesses, 200 plus employees altogether, small mom and pop shops that have opened up in the city over the last several months. I mean, this is the stuff that you talk about uh, and that you only dream about. And this is the stuff that we've been able to accomplish together with our teams. So when you talk about building teams, We've built a team with our fire department, with our police department, with our financial team. I think it's unquestionable that this financial team, our executive team, with Judge Macy, with Mary Sahadi, with Kathy Ann Viveris, is the best team in decades here in this community. And that is because this leader put that team together so that Thank we you. can move our city Please. forward. So we can move our city forward. You don't know what you're going to get with any other candidate. You know what you're getting right now. You know you have a mayor that's committed to eliminating fees and eliminating burdens wherever I can. You know you have a mayor that's committed to increasing services. You know you have a, may a mayor that's willing and listens to his department heads and gives them the resources they need to do a better job, and the results speak for themselves. That's why we're prepared to add positions to our school department, our police department, our fire department. We're prepared to continue to move our city forward with new parks, better parks, better sidewalks. We've done those, and we're going to continue to do those Thank you. in all the areas Thank you, of the city. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Riley. Thank you. So the question really is about, uh, it started out to be about social media and you know some things that are written there. I, I think as a candidate, uh, I was someone who was on social media quite a bit, and I think I've turned that down a little bit as I move forward because there is that rhetoric out there. It's not productive. It doesn't help us as candidates, and it doesn't help the city. For me, I use it as a tool to get my word out there, get the information out there, the things I stand for out there as much as possible. I have done nothing else but been a collaborative leader for my entire career. It doesn't matter if it's on the school committee working with um, six other school committee members for two terms, working on the city council. And uh, Joe, you're right. I did vote for you for mayor, uh, for mayor, for president of the city council. <laughs> and I, I did uh, vote against you for president of the city council as well. And I did that because I thought both were right at the time that I did them. I didn't do them because our relationship was tarnished or because we weren't working together. It just was the right thing at the right time. We could work together after that. My professional career has been built on that as well. You can't work together and um, not work together and work with kids. It doesn't work. 
I've evaluated and supervised staff my entire career. I set high expectations, and when my staff doesn't meet those expectations, the first thing I do is help them get there. It's sit with them and talk about the reason that they can't make the mark that we've set. Maybe the mark's too high, but also maybe they are understanding the way I've explained it. So for me, it's building a career off working with individuals who I supervise, who I work with, who are my colleagues, and working in the community with, again, the soccer leagues and different community activities that I've been involved in. You don't run a, a league with 1,100 kids without getting together and saying, this is how we're going to set up the league, this is how kids are going to flourish, and this is how we're going to pay for it for those kids who can't play. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Scott Pacheco. The question was, how will I, as your mayor, unify the city? I've already talked a bit about how I do not believe our city is broken. I do not believe in this rhetoric of a black cloud that keeps getting thrown about because I believe in us. That's why I'm running for mayor. I believe in you. I believe in the people of Fall River. But some ways, some concrete steps that I will make city government work for you, work for everyone, not just special interests or campaign donors or friends, First, I will be fiscally conservative. I think I'm probably the most fiscally conservative candidate, and that's a value that I've held for many years. Because I want your tax dollars to work for you and not for my friends. And so, the second way that I unify our city is that I will be, uh, in the first week, meeting with all of the department heads. I have a lot of experience building and supervising teams. And I'll understand, what are you working on? What are challenges you're facing? What are goals that you have? And how can I support you? Because if you're going to hold someone accountable, you need to make sure they have the tools that they need to get the job done. Additionally, I'm going to be an open and transparent mayor so that you will have trust in me. And how do we get there? I'm going to have hiring committees and panels for key positions in my administration. I am not promising jobs to my friends. I will be posting jobs on Indeed.com, on Mass Municipal website, standard things that professionals do so that you, the taxpayers, make sure your money is spent appropriately and we get the best talent for the job. That's also why I did a public record request and got the contracts for Kathy Ann Viveris, Judge uh, Macy, Corporation Counsel, and Mary Sahadi, Fiscal Officer. I've heard from so many of voters like you who think that they work for the city and not for you. They work, excuse me, they work for Jaisal Correa and not for you. And that's why I will be terminating them in my first months as mayor to make sure. Please. To make sure, I get a few more seconds. Go, keep going, please, right? please. I'm going to be making sure that those hiring committees hire the best talent using your Th dollars. You thank pay you. for their salaries and you should get good thank results. Thank you, thank you. One minute rebuttals now, Council Kamara. Thank you. I, I just think it's, uh, it's ironic when I hear the mayor say that you don't know what you're gonna get from any of these candidates. Well, I think after 23 years of service in the city council, my dedication, my commitment, I think you know exactly what you're gonna get from this candidate. And if there's anyone up here whose future is uncertain, I think it's the mayor's. I don't know where he's gonna be shortly, but I know where we're gonna be. So to say you don't know what you're gonna get from any of these candidates, I think his future is less certain than anyone else's up here. Thank you. Mr. Coogan? Again, I think um, if you want someone that's going to work with all the people in the city, uh, not just the people down on the sixth floor that uh, the mayor referred to a few of them, that he inherited those people from another administration. They weren't his, uh, his hires. He liked what they did in the previous administration, so he kept them on. That's respectable, but he, he didn't bring them in. They were already there. It's my position that we'll bring the best people to work in the mayor's office, in the maintenance office, in any office in the city, and it will be with input from the citizens. As I said before, I have every intention of going out to all the uh, water department, the maintenance department, and talk to those people and see what they're looking for in a leader, see what they're looking for in someone that can move those apartments around and save some money. If you engage people and you bring them into the conversation, they feel like they're part of it, and I think that's how you build teams throughout the city. May one minute. A couple things. So I did bring in Mary Sahadi and I did decide to keep some of my other team members who together under this administration have worked extremely well and under previous administrations were very fragmented. And the, again, the record speaks for itself in those previous years. But, you know, the person that has continued to uh, promote from within 
and promote a sense of, uh, of stability within our community is this administration. So we have moved more women up to higher, higher positions in this uh, administration than ever before. We have moved uh, people within city government to the top spots and within the city government uh, to different positions uh, more than any other administration. So I think that's really important to get out there. And I think what's also really important is as we move forward, the city is going to continue to progress because of the, stand, the, the bottom line that we have created, the new standard that this administration has created. And that is what we have delivered. We've been able to deliver that in just three years. There's still a lot more to be done, and that's why I'm asking that the citizens of Fall River continue to give me the opportunity to lead our team, all of our teams, and also just not lead from, uh, from the sixth floor, but down on the, on the streets with them as well. And that's something that I'm going to continue to do. Thank you. Mr. Riley? Yeah, just to um, add on to what I said before, I think what's important after a race like this happens is that we sit down with each other. We've all run for a reason. We've all decided that we put our name on that ballot and that we have ideas to move the city forward. I think that's a conversation early on. What do you bring to the table? How do I really reflect on what was said tonight and other debates and in the interviews from these people inside me to make sure that we're getting the most out of moving forward as a city? Secondly, working with the city council and school committee. The school committee relationship with the mayor has seemed to be pretty good, I'll say. With the city council, it has been non-movement. And I don't put that on one person. I put that on the bodies not getting together to work together for the citizens of Fall River. When something comes down from the mayor's office and it gets knocked down right away, or the truth doesn't come down from the mayor's office and there's frustration on the other side, those things need to be eliminated. I would sit down with every member of the city council on my first day in office Thank you. to make sure that Thank we you. start to build those relationships. Thank you. Ms. Scott Pacheco? I have a positive working relationship with the city council and I respect the work that they do in this often tough time where I, as a voter, often feel that Jaisal Correa tries to mandate what they, an independent body, do. And I'll give you an example of why I feel I have a positive relationship with them. When Jaisal Correa and Judge Macy instructed the water board, the Watepa water board, to approve a very secretive and controversial contract to sell our drinking water to a fracking company, Invenergy, I became aware of this, I did the research, I worked with the city councilors to educate them on the issue, and the city council passed two unanimous resolutions, one against the sale and two against the plant. It was an issue, I think, where I demonstrated my citizen activism and my ability to work with all of them. And I don't know about you, but sadly, it's hard to think of other times where they've passed things unanimously. I thank them for their leadership, and I will continue to respect that body and to work across thank you. city departments and with the council. Thank you. Unfortunately, we don't have time for another question. I want to be respectful of people's time. So we will start our three-minute closing statements right now. Our first closing statement will be provided by Kyle Riley. Well, thank you all for your time and attentiveness as we all put ourselves forward to the Citizens Forward tonight. Just recently, I watched the 2017 mayoral debate openings. About halfway through, Mr. Carrere said, and I quote, think about the uncalm and troubled waters before I took office. Think about our last mayor. Think about the smooth waters that are here now because of my administration. The waters have never been so rough. There are 13 federal indictments hanging over the mayor's head, and quite frankly, it feels like it's hanging over our heads as well. It has been repeated to me several times in this campaign season from individuals outside of Fall River. Aren't you from Fall River? Isn't that where the mayor got indicted? Did he go to jail yet? The office of mayor has to be a symbol of integrity and stability. It's what people look for within our city limits. The mayor's office and city council have never been farther apart in my lifetime. I have never seen a time when individual personalities rule the day and the level of vindictiveness and the intimidates our citizens. Economic development has to be more than a couple words or a quick claim on social media when something falls your way. This is a serious time in Florida. Everyone is watching. Take the time when you get home tonight to Google Fall River Mayor and tell me if those are the first stories you want to see. 
We should be looking at the successes that can happen and the turnaround that is about to begin. I started off this night sharing with you what drives me, the stability that I know we can achieve for our families, the collaboration that our children need to see in all of us as we do our best to move the city forward. I hopefully have elaborated on my positions with you on topics that are of interest of you and our city. This is why I ask you to vote yes on the recall, vote for Kyle Riley on the bottom half of the ticket, and let's work together and let's lead together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next closing statement will come from Councilor Joe Camara. I'd like to thank everyone again for coming out this evening and those watching at home. I'd also like to thank the other candidates for recognizing the future of our city under the current administration is in jeopardy and that a change must be made. Although our plans and opinions may be different, we all share in the common goal of making Fall River a better place to live and work. As a city councilor, I have always been proactive on some of the most pressing and important city issues. From my first resolution that began the process of relining our outdated water mains to creating the ATMC, which is now known as the Meditech site, I've been committed to making strategic, intelligent, and rational decisions for the city. I am proud to have been part of the Commerce Park, the creation of Commerce Park, which is also the home to the new North End Fire Station, Fall River Fire Department headquarters, and training center. This project promoted business growth, gave our residents a place to work, and provided desperately needed tax revenue for our city. I've been involved in every new school building in the last 20 years including the new BMC Durfee High School, which is saving the taxpayers millions of dollars and providing our children with the technology and the environment they need to excel academically. I'm a lifelong Fall River resident, a father, a homeowner, and taxpayer. My wife, Lila, and I have raised our three children, Rachel, Brianna, and Joseph, here. I will do whatever it takes to ensure that Fall River's children have the best opportunities for their future and to grow up in a city they can be proud of. I have decided to run for mayor because I have the right combination of skills and a long record of accomplishments through my many years of service on the city council. I have received several citations and letters of recognition from senators, congressmen, and the governor for my exceptional public service to my community. I have the experience that is required, now more than ever, to move our city forward. Experience matters. I believe that the public service means public trust. As your next mayor, I will never betray that trust because trust matters. I want to thank you all for your time, and I respectfully ask for your vote on Tuesday, March 12th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next closing statement will be made by Mayor Correa. Well, good evening once again. Thank you, everyone, for watching at home. Thank you to my family, my supporters, uh, to everyone that put this debate together and to all the uh, supporters on every side. Uh, this is a lot of work, as you know, and uh, it's tiring and it takes a lot out of you. Uh, tonight, you heard my plans. You've heard what I've accomplished already. Uh, you've heard about my team. You've heard about my ability to build teams. You've heard about some of the challenges our community is facing. You haven't seen me read a statement from a piece of paper that was pre-prepared by my colleagues or my fans or whatever. You see me talk to you, the people. Every question on target, with the right answers. I am the person that's standing on the stage that has led our community from the most challenging times that affected your lives, not affected my life. I'm going through a challenge. I need your help. I need your support. But I have weathered the storms for this community. I have calmed the waters of this community's storms, taking us from receivership to now economic prosperity, changing the economic development conversation. You saw here tonight just the quality of the questions in this debate. They'd rather know, the media, who we'd vote for instead than ask a question about economic development. Because they don't want to hear it. The people of this community deserve this mayor to continue by full term and continue to move the city forward as I've done for the last three years. That is my only concern. That is what I have done every single day in this job. And that's what I will continue to do. So when you think about somebody that you can trust to eliminate fees, think of Jaisal Carrere.
when you think of somebody you can trust to continue to fund our fire and police departments so that they know that they have the resources that they need. Think of the things that I've already done and the things I will do. When you think about the future of trash in this community, think about the transfer station. When you think about the future of every single student in this community, think about the commitment that we've made to our schools. Think about the workforce training that we're doing in new sectors like wind energy. Think about marrow manufacturing and the announcement we're making tomorrow. I have not ever betrayed the trust of the citizens of Fall River. And I cannot, I cannot blame myself. I cannot uh, feel sorry that I have been accused. There are people standing here on this table that have been accused. You at home may have been accused of something. You can't stop yourself from being accused. But you know what? I can stand here tonight and honestly look at every single person in this community and say, I have done the best job that I can as your mayor. And I am asking for your vote to continue to be the mayor of this city. So that's why I need your vote, no or against the recall, and on the bottom half for Jaisal Career II, so that we can continue to lead this great community. Thank you. Good night. I love you all. Thank you. Please, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our next closing statement by Paul Coogan. Well, I got to follow that. <laughs> Here we go. Honesty, integrity, the ability to bring people together, working cooperatively with others for the common good. These will be the hallmarks of my administration just as I have done throughout this campaign and during my three decades of public service. Gone will be the days of casting blame, pay to play, revenge politics, and the mayor's inability to lead. Fall River is better than this. Our city faces many issues, but as we are all well aware, there is a dark cloud hanging over our city, not the people, our city. It overshadows our regular, everyday challenges, and this cloud will leave when the mayor is gone. The mayor has chosen to characterize a 13 count felony criminal indictment brought forth by the US attorney as a personal business matter or some wild conspiracy to remove him from office. These statements are not true. Personal business matters do not require handcuffs or bail and are not decided in a federal criminal proceeding. This situation and the charges are more than just a distraction for our city. People that can help us, our United States Senator, our Congressman, the Governor, the Fall River City Council, and many other elected officials have asked the mayor to leave. Because the city, like all municipalities, relies on state and federal dollars, along with the assistance of state and federal delegations. The current arrangement is not working. The view of Fall River from the outside looking in is not a good one. We should all agree Fall River deserves better than this, and how do we get back on track? All the candidates on stage tonight told you why they want to be mayor, but I am the only one with the skills, education, solid work history, and political experience necessary to bring the city together. I am the one candidate who promises to lead by example and reinvest most of my salary back into Fall River to improve the quality of life for all of our city residents. Can anyone else on the stage say this? Does anyone else have this type of experience? It is time to put this legal nightmare behind us and to get on to solving the important issues that confront Fall River. March 12th is the date when we can begin to take the first steps forward. I respectfully ask that you vote yes on the recall and vote for Paul Coogan for mayor so that we can get this city moving on the right track together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our final closing statement from Erica Scott Pacheco. This election is about the question of what kind of city do we want to be? I have a vision for our city. I have a vision to fix the broken system. I've shared with you some of my concrete plans and actionable, measurable steps that I will take within certain time frames once elected as your mayor. I think that's what sets me apart. To fix the broken system, we have to think, where do we want to be in four years? 
And we also need to look backwards. Where were we four years ago? We were having another recall. Here we are today, recall number two. Do we want to be there, recall number three, in four years? My vision for Fall River is a vision where I am your mayor, providing stability, transparency, open government, and fighting for you, fighting for your working families, fighting for elders on fixed incomes, fighting for kids, fighting to make our Fall River a place for everyone. Some of my vision of what our city looks like, a city hall filled with competent, qualified staff who got their jobs through hiring committees, not through connections, who are working hard and compensated fairly, not receiving unnecessary and costly stipends for doing work. A school district where kids are thriving and parents are engaged, teachers have the materials that they need, not one where teachers have to buy their own supplies or where kids and parents feel disrespected or even go hungry. Neighborhoods where everyone is able to have a good road and a clean sidewalk. People with disabilities can navigate in a wheelchair or a scooter down that sidewalk. Not a city where only select and privileged neighborhoods get fixed while the others keep falling into disrepair. A city government that is fiscally responsible and puts an end to the ever-increasing taxes, fees, and burdens on the homeowners. Not one where trump cards are pulled at the 11th hour simply for votes. This is my vision of the city. That's why I ask humbly for you to vote yes on the recall and for me, Erica Scott Pacheco, to serve you as your mayor. Together, we can get to that vision. I don't have all the answers, none of my opponents have all the answers, no one in the world does, but I can promise that I will listen to you. I've even changed my own opinions, for instance, on the purple bags, after hearing your feedback. That's why I'm asking for you to join me as we move Fall River forward for all of us, for the elder on a fixed income who's worried about being priced out of the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes tonight's debate. I want to thank our candidates, our panelists, Morton Middle School. You can watch replays of this debate on FRC Media and FRG TV between now and Election Day. And please, thank you for joining us, and please vote on March 12th.